fancy doing another one of these. Uh, so we're going to look at the Scorpions today. So hopefully I can rattle through this fairly quickly because there's a lot of albums. If not, we may end up in two parts. So basically Scorpions form, Rudolf Schenker formed in 1965. I think they're called the Scorpions, then the Scorpions. Uh, and imagine they're, they're kind of a Beatles covers, you know, type of band, some original stuff playing the sort of pop uh, of the time. Uh, so I'm not sure how that progresses really through the 60s, but there is pictures of them. Uh, and Rudolf, Rudolf Schenker is the, the consistent uh, member. There's, there's none of the other members who eventually come into it. Um, but uh, obviously keeps that name. He's the one constant. Uh, but it's not until 1972 or 71 uh, when his younger brother Michael joins and he hooks up with Klaus Mine. It's maybe 1970. Uh, and they, I forget which label it's on, but they do the Lonesome Crow album. Uh, that comes out in 1972. So Michael Schenker is Rudolf's younger brother. He's a young guitar prodigy. Basically, he's taken up the instrument, uh, copied Rudolf, um, and he's, his playing's pretty phenomenal for his age. Um, so the Lonesome Crow album, uh, you know, it doesn't bear much resemblance to what comes later. It's uh, produced by a guy called Connie Frank, who had a background in kraut Kra rock. I think he produced Can, but I'm not sure about that. Um, so there's quite a lot of long songs, a lot of sort of spacey, uh, slightly psychedelic elements, uh, particularly on the title track. Uh, and then, you know, you get the sort of power chord riffs uh, that to mirror things like Black Sabbath and what's come before in the 1960s, kind of cream and things like that. Um, but it doesn't have a lot of focus. You recognise Klaus's vocals. Um, there is a track called In Such Peace of Mind, uh, which later became a kind of live favourite that works really well. Um, I don't have a copy of the album because uh, I briefly had it to check it out, but I just couldn't connect with it. Um, uh, I think there's, you know, there's, there's better debut albums by bands that, although they don't sound like the band, they're still good, like, say, Rock and Roll by Judas Priest. You know, it doesn't sound like what Judas Priest became, but it is a good heavy rock album. But I just don't think Lumps and Crow does the band justice. There just isn't anything there that would give me something to hold on to. Even Michael Schenker, you can hear little flashes of what's to come, but he's a long way off the finished article. Uh, if you're interested, you can go on YouTube, and there's a video for um, a song called I'm, I'm Going Mad, I think. Uh, and that's quite weird. Class has got a beard and, you know, it's uh, they just look nothing like what they're going to become. Now, I think what happens next is they actually kind of disband. Um... Uh, Michael, uh, obviously, the, he goes to UFO. Um, uh, basically, the, the Scorpions are touring with UFO uh, in Germany. They need uh, Bernie Marsden, uh, is their guitarist at this point. He can't get to the gig for some reason. He's stuck in England. Michael learns the set very quickly uh, with Pete Way, um, basically communicating sign language or something. Uh, some form of that, and uh, he does the gig. He's poached by UFO. They're, they've already had success in Japan. They're better set up, and set up than the Scorpions, and he goes on to make the Phenomenon album, and the, the rest is guitar history. So at this point, I think the Scorpions are left in limbo. Rudy and Klaus has kind of disbanded, I think, but then there's another band here called, um, I think it's Dark Roads or something like that. Again, don't quote me on that. And... Um, uh, Uli Roth plays in that band. They rehearse at a theatre, uh, like a, um, where they get together their songs and stuff. Uh, the Scorpions, Class and Rudy, somehow they hook up down there, and the two bands kind of come together, uh, and they decide to see keep the Scorpions name, but now they just call it Scorpions anyway. So that's a sort of potted history, and that leads to their first proper kind of album that sounds like. They are banned, they're going to become, and that's 1974's Fly to the Rainbow, funky sort of psychedelic cover there. When I was younger, didn't listen to Sam, but knew the track Speed is Coming. That's uh, that's the track, if you played it to people, it, it sounds like what they're going to become. But a lot of this, it keeps the kind of progressive and the progressive and some of the space rock elements of Lonesome Crow, but it's more successful. Uh, also, early John Roth's very Hendrix influence, so. He's bringing some of that in, and again, uh, if you know if you know tracks off like Electric Ladyland, uh, in particular, where they've got this kind of spaced out moments on Hendrix, that's what kind of seeps into this, uh, in a good way. Um, 
So uh, Speedy's coming to Great Rocker. Then you've got the next track. They need a million. Uh, which you know it's, it's a canny track. Drifting Sun. This was a live favourite. It's really good. Uh, fly people fly. It's a canny tune. This is my song. You'll find a video of this. Uh, quite a pleasant track. Uh, you know, none of this is kind of earth shaking. Then there's a track of Far Away. Um, again, it, it's a nice tune. Uh, but then it finishes with the title track, Flight of the Rainbow, and that has some uh, the live version that has some sort of phenomenal work from Uli John Roth. Um, so this album's good. I mean, it's a good sort of six, seven out of ten. It's kind of fitting into that era of hard rock where there's still a progressive element in it. Um, and like I said, they're sort of keeping this sort of time, slightly kind of space rock thing going with this. Um, Uli John Roth, uh, um, you know, there's there's some great guitar on this. Um, he uses some some harmonised parts. Uh, Sweet Speed is Coming has incredible whammy bar work and interestingly enough Van Halen used to cover it and I've always wondered whether that's where Van Halen gets his crazy whammies from is it that he's listened to Uli John Roth and mimic that because he's never name checked Hendrix um, and pretty much back then it's either Hendrix for the whammy uh, or, or Blackmore you know those are the two guys who kind of use the whammy in a pretty crazy way maybe Terry Caff of Chicago uh, a bit as well um uh, and then obviously you know for someone like Halen if he wasn't listening to those guys where do you get it from so I, I just think Uli Roth so anyway this this gets them gets them going so it's a good record it's worth checking out Klaus uh, you know is in fine form uh, and uh, the, the production uh, you know it's typical of the 70s uh, era um, I think Dear to Dirks produces that certainly he his association with the band starts around that time uh, and then it comes to their third album, but they're really the first one where they really start the sound, you know, like the Scorpions, we initially know and love, uh, 75's in trance. Uh, I think slowly but surely this has become a, a classic album. I do think it's a classic album of the era, uh, and it's one of the great uh, hard rock records and proto-metal records um, uh, of 1975. When I say proto metal, what I mean by that is it's kind of albums that are starting that sound and they're going to influence heavy metal and hard rock. And when that genre finally decides what it's called and what it looks and sounds like, this will be a part of that. Um, as well, uh, as some of these tracks are on the live album Tokyo Tapes, which we'll come to. But um, this, uh, I heard this one is very young. Um, I was about 10. Uh, I think again, a neighbour had it and they brought it over. I was blown away by the track Dark Lady and um, early John Roth's. Uh, Guitar playing. Um, it's an interesting track, basically. Uli Roth used to share some of the vocals with Klaus Main. Uh, and he hasn't got a great voice at all, Uli Roth, but he's got something. He, he sounds like Uli Roth. Um, and he kind of works on this track. He sings the verses and then Klaus does this amazing wailing on the choruses. Back at this time, Klaus Main was really pushing the higher register. Um, so you can hear uh, a lot of that. Um, across these early albums later on he'll have throat problems he'll just drop things a little bit and go a bit easier on himself um, so it's a really cool picture of the guys on the back um, uh, by this point Francis Buchholz has joined them uh, so uh, you've got you know components of the classic lineup or one of the classic lineups uh, and then you've got a guy called Rudy Lenners on drums uh, I think he's sort of tired of the touring uh, and a general unhealthy lifestyle um, so he he left um, uh after the next album but um, on this yeah Dark Lady that's a great track In Trance classic title track uh, great class vocal sort of classic pa uh, ballad slash heavy track that would become a trademark you got Life's Like a River similar sort of thing quite epic uh, Top of the Bill live favourite amazing Uli John Roth uh, whammy bar work on that uh, and then Living and Dying finished original side one I think what's interesting on this album is uh, later on the Scorpions could do you know sort of daft and party rock lyrics uh, the lyrics are really introspective here they're sort of looking at life and struggles in life and mortality and things like that and again it's typical of the, the era sort of a bit deeper some progressive elements um, but again the, the songs are tight on this and I think it's probably dear to Dirks' influence there as a producer they had a long relationship with him uh, and he's one of those producers I mean he's captured the sound of the band um, you know, he's not um, he's not uh, kind of putting something in there that's not. Um, side two open with Robot Man, which is a great fun track, live favourite. Again, more classic Uli, uh, great sort of Klaus. Then Evening Wind, uh, 
again, that's another sort of introspective track. Then you've got a kind of Hendrixy bluesy track, the Uli Singh Sun in my hand, which is good fun. Then Longing for Fire, it's a bit more up tempo, some great Uli guitar. And then it finishes with a little instrumental night light. So I think side two is not quite as good as side one, but it's really strong. This is actually a Japanese pressing. Um, it's 24 bit mastering, but it's never been uh, remastered because it was on RCA. Um, you know, it's been kind of licensed out. So basically, they do that. That is an early classic, but then they produce one of the true early classics of uh, hard rock and metal, 70s, 60s version killer. Um, great year for hard rock and metal. No, no heavy petting by UFO and Judas Priest, Sonal Sad Wings of Destiny. This sits right in there with it. Basically, they're getting in the groove more. Um, they're finding their sound. Uh, Uli, Drof, Uli Roth is developing as a guitar player. So this track opens, uh, this album, sorry, opens with Pictured Life, uh, which is one of their classic tracks. Uh, it's got a great um, guitar line by Uli Roth. Uh, this probably inspired a lot of guitarists, and he, he uses two-part harmony. So often Uli Roth will do a twin harmony, even though that wasn't repeated live. It, um, Rudy Schenker would just stick to rhythm. Then it's got one of the great all-time rockers, Catch a Train. Uh, really, really good uh, up-tempo track. This great melody, great chorus. I know I'm sounding like a stuck record. Um, but Uli Roth pulls off a phenomenal solo on this, uh, one of his greatest. Then there's In Your Park, which is a, uh, another great track, um, great Uli -like guitar lines. Obviously, Rudy Schenker coming to the fore as a writer as well with his, um, you know, his, his great chord changes and his, his simplicity. Um, backstage Queen next, it's another great rocker, brilliant guitar, great um, chorus, really good hooks. Then the title track, Virgin Killer. This, this finished the original side one, I think. Um, on the vinyl uh, and uh, that's a great you know really kind of crazy rocker um, then Hellcat opened uh, side two kind of Hendrixy bluesy uh, then Crying Days that's one of my favourite tracks it's got a great um, great chord change great chord part by Uli then Polar Nights which is another live favourite and uh, Uli sort of Hendrixy vibe and then it finishes with a ballad Yellow Raven um, and again the guitar solo and this is quite innovative um, Uli Roth plays a line uh, where he, he, he kind of um, basically introduces the kind of ideas that uh, 80s guitarists are going to use, uh, people like Randy Rhodes and things like that. Um, uh, for the for the uh, musers out there, he uses a diminished 7 arpeggio and harmonises it, so we'll get that out of the way. Uh, obviously the controversy about his album, this is the, uh, you know, the, the cover. Uh, you see most of the time the original vinyl had a really horrible cover um, with a young girl on the front. Um, so less said about that the better great album and I would say this and Entrance are both you know 9 out of 10 or all that certainly is maybe Entrance 8 and a half but really good the next album uh, is important in, in for, for two reasons aside from it being excellent as well um, is Herman Relbell joins on drums uh, and he will be a key band member this is 1977 it's taken by force he'll become a key band member and he'll also write lyrics and this is Uli John Roth's last album, a studio album with the band. Um, quite interesting, Uli Roth decided, you know, he would just do, f uh, well, he did four studio albums and a live album. He, you know, he, he did it to kind of get noticed and get in a, a touring band and a better opportunity, but he, he just had other ideas and wanted to move on. We'll, we'll come to a track he didn't like on here. Um, so Taken By Force, yeah, it's kind of the end of one classic lineup and the start of the number with Rare Bell coming in. Um, this is a great album. I don't think it's as good as the previous two, but it is really good. Um, but I think what comes in here is a, a focus on a couple of tracks that are, are very kind of catchy and will kind of um, telegraph where the band will go. Now, it opens with Steam Rock Fever, and this was the straw that broke the camel's back of Uli. He just thought it was daft. I really like it. But it's it's a cheesy party rock chorus. Um, uh, quite interesting. It's got a, a sort of, um, uh, what's called a, a Phrygian... Middle Eastern sounding a verse uh, again. Uli John Roth introducing that on this record, and will come. That will appear um, later down the track listing as well. Then it starts a second track from the all-time classic "Will Burn the Sky." Um, phenomenal track. Uh, it's actually got a different uh, um, uh, co-writer on it. So just you know it's Danaman. I wonder if that's Monica Danaman, uh, Uli's girlfriend. Maybe she did the lyrics. Anyway, I've got to be free. Yeah, that's a kind of Hendrixy. Um, uh, kind of quite funky sort of track uh, it's really good Uli doesn't um, sing on this album then you've got The Riot of Your Time that's really good it's kind of kind of a jangly acoustic and distorted guitars and that finished side one 
Um, so this album it's got kind of deeper cuts, you know. Um, side two opens with one of the seminal tracks in the development of heavy metal, the sales of Quran. Um, so basically, in a nutshell, this uh, uses a really important mode in heavy metal called the Phrygian dominant mode. Uh, I'm not going to the music theory behind that, but um, Richie Blackmore used it as well. Um, later on, Ingvo Malmsteen will use it, and you'll hear in thrash metal and bands like Symphony X and Dream Fear, and you know the list is endless. But basically, this is the first kind of really metal use of it. Uh, Uli John Roth, the track opens with a riff, and Uli John Roth basically reinvents guitar soloing. Um, I know that sounds melodramatic, but basically the solo he plays, the scale uh, choices he uses, and the the, the thing, some of the things he does will basically inspire guys like Marty Friedman, Ingve Malmsteen, people like that. Not that well, not Ingve always admits to it. And it will change how electric guitar sounds in the 80s. I should just quickly name check his countryman, Michael Schenker, on the, in UFO, Michael Schenker's doing some similar things with different things, and that will basically write part of the book. That will write kind of, the, you know, two chapters. And then Eddie Van Halen will come along in 1978, and then that's it. That sort of triangle will progress in the 80s, and those techniques, scale sounds, will basically define 80s guitar. In, in hard rock and metal. So South Carolina's a classic all-time track. And you've got the Your Light, which is, as you said, everyone was more Hendrix before. This is a really Hendrix one. It's soft. Um, it's really, really good. It's really funky. Then another sort of controversial track, He's a Woman, She's a Man. Live favourite, great riff. I'm not sure who was into this as much either, but it's a great track. And then it finishes with one of the most interesting ballads they did, Born to Touch Your Feelings. And this, I think this is another important one, Yellow Raven. Well, in Trans finished with Night Lights and um, uh, Virgin Killer finished with Yellow Raven. Now they're both ballady. Uh, Yellow Raven sort of soft, but I think Born to Touch Your Feelings has a style of ballad and this will be a recurring theme on their albums. But what's interesting with this track, it kind of has a, a phone conversation in, in French at the end. Um, I really like it. The bonus track on this is Suspend the Love studio version. This is a great track. And the live version of this is very beloved, which we'll come to. Um, so in actual fact, you know, you could have had an extra track on this and it's well worth checking out. So this, um, yeah, it's, it's again, it's that thing. It is kind of a classic album. Um, you know, I don't think it's as good as the other two, but it's just these bands are on a run. They're so good. And the, the genre has been developed all the time that everything they do is interesting. You know, I think one of the problems now... It's because everything's kind of been done, you know, like some bands that end up sounding the same or they make the same album kind of sounding album because the story's been written. Where's the book's been written here? So it's great. Then they did a live album, Tokyo Tapes. I didn't never heard this when I was younger. Um, and then uh, a friend, a flatmate of mine, uh, he loved it and he got it on CD. Uh, we listened to it, I think I taped a copy or something like that. And it's a classic live album. Uh, it's... Again, bands at this time typically doing a few studio arms and then they're doing a live album that's a kind of summation of where they're at at that point and then typically they'll progress on with a different sound. That's true of the Scorpions, Judas Priest and UFO. Um, uh, Finn Lizzy as well. Um, you know, they capture their eras. Uh, this actually starts with a track purely for the um, album All Night Long. I think you can get a studio version of this. It's great. It's got a great Uli sort of funky riff. Then you've got Picture Life Backstage Queen in Trance. We'll Burn the Sky goes into Suspend the Love on this. And that's some, um, uh, I was down like a second of Rattle Storm. The guy was um, uh, raving about that. And it, it is great how it goes in. Then they're doing Such a Peace of Mind. Um, uh, that's um, uh, the track uh, off um, Action. Oh, sorry, off Lonesome Crow. Um, actually, I didn't mention before, just quickly, Lonesome Crow did have another title later on. It was reissued and there was a weird cover with a girl in a yellow jeep and they called it Action. I can't remember what record label it was on, but later on I found out in 75 that Scorpions actually did a version of Action by the Sweet and Fox on the run in German uh, to obviously get some money for Dirty Dirks or whatever. Um, and um, they did it under a different name. So that's my feeling that when that was issued as is that name, why they called it Action. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a couple of crap rock and roll, hard dog and long dog tour, so I can do about that. But it's a really good album. The band's really tight. Um, Uli and Rudy, you know, really sound are just totally on point, uh, really tight, and um, fantastic guitar. So Uli John Roth leaves at this point. 
then things get uh, strange in the guitar sense, but they make what for many people is their greatest album, Love Drive. So this is a tricky one because as I've got older, I've grown to kind of enjoy the Uli stuff more. Um, but there's no doubt this is like a key, uh, you know, coming just before the 1980s. It's a, a, a diamond of a hard rock album. Um, so at this point, they get uh, Michael Schenker in. Uh, no, they get Matthias Jabs in on guitar. Matthias Jabs does some of the recording on this. But then Michael Schenker leaves the earphone and becomes available. So he does some of the recording. And he actually goes out on tour, but then decides not to, to be in the Scorpions. And Matthias Jabs comes back and is, is becomes a full member and will become a key member. And this that will eventually give you the second proper classic lineup. Um, this sounds great. There's not a bad track on it. It's only eight tracks. Loving Your Sunday Morning, uh, great track. Um, Another Piece of Meat, classic Michael Schenker solo on this. Always Somewhere. Um, again, this starts a formula as well of having two ballads. At this time, that doesn't get sort of hackneyed. Always somewhere superb. Then it finishes with one of their all-time great songs on side one, which is Coast to Coast. It's an instrumental. And this track was a showstopper, always a showstopper when they play live. Basically, class straps on the guitar. Bass and three guitars go down the front, and it's a great moment uh, with the audience. Uh, great guitar by Michael on that. Side two opens with Can't Get Enough, which is... Um, for me, it's the weakest track on the album, but it's a really great rocker. Again, that's another kind of track that they will copy. It's a style of track they will copy on the subsequent albums. Then they do a kind of weird reggae-infused track called Is There Anybody There, which is brilliant. It's got great guitar by the first jabs. And then Love Drive, brilliant gallop. I saw them play that at the Royal Albert Hall in um, 2006. Then the formula of having the ballad on the end, it finishes with one of their all-time classics, Holiday. Um... Uh, with a lovely um, arpeggiated guitar part by Rudolph showing his qualities as a writer. Um, so uh, the the Michael Schenker plays great on this, but he kind of sits back a bit. He kind of, um, it's less fireworks than UFO. Matthias Jabs does a really good job, but he, he's not the Matthias who will appear later. He's kind of finding his way. Um, so in some ways it would benefit from a better Matthias, but it's it's a great record. Um, you know, uh, it's probably, you know, it's my favourite album of 1979. It's probably as close to a 10 out of 10 as you're going to get. So the next album kind of initially had the misfortune of come, becoming between two classic albums. But when you look at it now, it's actually a really great record. And that's 1980's Animal Magnetism. So this comes out in a key year of 1980 when loads of bands are releasing great albums. And this sits perfectly well in there. Um, opens with Make It Real which is one of their great uh, melodic hard rock songs to do then the next track Don't Make no, no Promises it's kind of like another piece of meat off the Love Drive album so it's it's kind of in that spirit um, interestingly enough this is co-written by Matthias Jabs and he does his first great solo on this track um, so you've got to remember Matthias Jabs basically Michael Schenk has been in the Scorpions and Neil Joff has been in the Scorpions uh, the two greatest guitarists of their era uh, at a certain point and um, you know he's he's got a lot to live up to but the way he navigates that is just by being himself and people nickname him the German Van Halen and that's quite a good sort of analogy um, so uh, you've got that track Hold Me Tight which is it's good good slow rocker 20th century man those two tracks aren't quite as good side one they do a ballad of Lady Starlight which is a lovely lovely ballad and then a favourite deep cut of mine Falling In Love that's got a great riff um, Only a Man's probably my least favourite track and then one of the all time classics The Zoo it's got a great talk box guitar by Matthias and then it finishes with Animal Magnetism which is one of the kind of darkest heaviest tracks um, uh, kind of Middle Eastern um, really slow tempo really kind of heavy um, and it's different it's different from Love Drive there's you know there's a couple of elements um, I love the album cover uh, so it was a good it was a strong record to take him into 1980 so at this point, um, I think the Love Drive album eventually goes gold in the States, as does Animal Magnetism. Uh, it's taken them a long time to get um, that kind of traction, but they're becoming, you know, they're becoming like a really solid headline act. Then they go to do the next album, and perhaps mine has throat nodules and loses his voice. So there's actually takes, instead of this album coming out in 1981, typically taking a year, it doesn't come out till 82. Um, Don Dockin actually just scratched vocals on it and does some backing vocals. 
at this point they're still with Dirty Dirks, he's produced every album, every album sounds similar, they've all got quite toppy guitars, they have a fat bottom end on the bass, fairly splotchy drums and Klaus's vocals are always recorded pretty crisply um, uh, and he just kind of captures a simple sound and it, the other distinctive thing with the Scorpions is the guitars will be panned hard left and right and both guitars play distinctive parts and this will be um, something copied by other bands. Uh, you know, band like Rat uh, would be an example of a two-guitar band who's probably kicking a leaf from that. But anyway, 1982, uh, also the year of Number of the Beast by Iron Maiden and Screaming for Vengeance by Judas Priest, the Scorpions match them with their own classic album. Uh, so the argument would be, is this better than Love Drive? Um, I would say Love Drive is the better record, but I think what this benefits from is the arrival, uh, fully, fully formed, of Matthias Jabs as a great guitar player. Um, so basically it opens with Blackout Tar Track, a great rocker, uh, and what happens here again is the thing I was just previously saying is basically guitars are pan hard left and right, but Matthias Jazz does something really, really interesting, he, he doesn't f copy Rudy's rhythm basically, he plays almost like a, a, a single note kind of lead guitar line all the way through, he's kind of got a little bit of riffing, he'll do licks and fills in one pass like Van Halen, hence the German Van Halen, uh, but he never treads on uh, Rudy's toes, never treads on the t song's toes and he, he creates something unique in hard rock. Uh, and then in the solo in the middle, he delivers a total zinger. He really, really does um, deliver a great solo. His tones uh, got quite a lot of top end up. So I'm wondering whether he uses the wah, wah a little bit just to um, get that extra uh, top end up. So, you know, it's taken a couple of arms for him to find his feet. Next track, Can't Live Without You is great. Got a great chord change, brilliant solo by Matthias, um, great vocal by Klaus. You wouldn't know he'd had his operation. No One Like You, um, next, that's one of their all-time classics. Again, beautiful guitar, um, drop-down ballad section in the verse, lovely vocal. Then when the album sort of deeper cups, you give me all I need. That's three tracks of you in the title. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really good track. It's not as good. Um, uh, Rudy does a solo on this. Then it finishes the original side one with a track called Now, which is a fun rocker, uh, but it's at it's this point the kind of like the, the Can't Get Enough track that was on uh, Love Drive. You know, this is in that style. Got some great guitar by Matthias. Side two opens with an all-time classic Dynamite. It's got a phenomenal... Um, well, Matthias Jab solo on this, he just does something kind of really crazy. Um, he does a lot of work on palm harmonics, but what's interesting about it, he just totally goes out there and does something quite crazy with the solo. Um, uh, and under normal circumstances it maybe wouldn't work but just the way he plays is absolutely fantastic and it's uh, I can't think of a I think he's one of those guitarists his, his playing's got a lot more energy than a lot of players there's real excitement and edginess about his playing then you've got Arizona which is a really good uh, sort of major key rocker the album's epic China White which is really good and then it finishes with a really nice ballad when the smoke is going down um and at this point, they've, they've kind of abandoned any introspective sort of lyrics. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's debatable whether they had much of that on the previous two albums, but the, the sound of this by now is they're not sounding, you know, anything like the Uli era. That album goes platinum. Uh, they become headline acts. Um, there's footage of them from that time, and they're, they're absolutely phenomenal. I, I should say that the Scorpions are the best live band I've ever seen. Um I've never I've seen them several times live. They never let you down. Um, they've got precision and an energy. So next to do this album now, I I still think it's classic and it's an important album for them. But I don't like it as much as I used to. That's not so I don't love it. It's love at first sting. So this is their big album. This sells six million copies worldwide, and it has this signature track "Rot You Like a Hurricane." Um, uh, and they do a massive tour. Uh, this is them at the absolute zenith in America. Uh, and they're one of the biggest rock, hard rock and metal bands in the world. Um, there's a great picture of them at the back here, obviously in the pomp. Uh, uh, Mathias with his top striped uh, gear on. Um, Opens with Bad Boys Running Wild, great track. Phenomenal guitar solo. Just one of their great openers. Love it. Right, you like Hurricane. No need to talk about that. It's great. Solo's awesome. Next track, I'm Leaving You, I really like. Um, it's kind of repetitive, but in a good way. It's just... It, um, doesn't really have a chorus, it's just kind of got a repeating verse section and another section and various guitar lines, uh, really cool guitar on that. But I like it, something slightly different for them. Then Coming Home, they often used to open live with this, uh, it's really good. 
great up tempo track with um, brilliant guitar work by Matthias. Again, he's doing that thing where he's playing the rhythm, uh, but interplaying in between Rudy and doing great fills. And then side one finishes with a turkey, and this is where the formula thing of um, can't get enough kind of starts to go wrong. They do a track called The Same Thrill, um, but I just really don't like it. Um, you know, uh, it just doesn't do it for me. Side two was a great uh, commercial rocker, Big City Nights. And then there's a couple of tracks which are good as soon as a good time to roll and crossfire, but it just don't feel like whenever they come on, like I feel like I don't want to listen to them as much. Uh, the album finishes with another ballad. Again, the formula of having the ballad on the end, but it is one of their greats. It's still loving, still loving you. So that this album, you know, it's some big city nights, right? Like Hurricane, still loving you. Three very big tracks, and still loving you, still a big thing on American radio. So, you know, I think this is an eight out of ten. Um, and that ends a classic era. They do, again, like they did with Tokyo Tapes, that era is surmised, I think, with the Worldwide Live album. And I think this is the last great live album of the era of live albums. Once the 80s come in, production gets so much better that live albums can never sound as good as studio albums. Um, whereas in the 1970s, a band might do recordings in 76, when they play them live, it sounds more ballsy. Finn Lizzy and Judas Priest would be two examples of that. Um, so this album's, it's uh, it's great. I mean, what's interesting, they don't play any early era stuff, so it's Love Drive onwards. And the Love Drive tracks really kick ass and the fast jabs. Um, his solo on Loving Your Sunday Morning is phenomenal. So he basically plays the same solo he did on Love Drive, but he's playing kind of up to notch and he did some great uh, great stuff on that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a really good... Um, really captures uh, what it must have been like to see them at the peak. And I think it's a really, really strong live album, again, along with Live After Death by Maiden in 85. After that, like I say, my personal opinion is this, I'm not fussed with live albums, but that one. So there's kind of that 10 year period from Entrance to that. And all those records uh, are worth anyone's time if you're interested in hard rock and metal. After that, they take four years to do the next album, Savage Amusement. Uh, I saw them on this tour, it was great. They had a massive Flying V lighting rig. A lot of people criticise this album, and they do, because um, there's a lot of controversy. They fell out with Dear to Dirks, and it, um, it went on too long a recording. Um, it's, it's a good record. It's not as good as what's gone before, but it has got really good tracks, and the first four tracks are really good. Don't Stop at the Top, Rhythm of Love, Passion Rules Again, The Media Overkill. One of my favourite choruses, that. Side one, Finish with Walking on the Edge, not a track I was fussed with. Then there's We Let It Rocky Let It Roll, which is a pretty good track. I think they opened with that when I saw them live. Um, and then my favourite track on the album, Every Minute of the Day, that's great. Uh, that's a really cool track. And then there's Love On The Run. Uh, I'm not, I don't like that one. And then Believe In Love, actually really like that. It's again, the finish with a ballad. Um, but uh, I never used to like that track, but it's it's a really nice track. And Mathias is really good on this. I don't think he's quite as sharp as he was in the previous two albums. I think the solos are mixed a bit too low. Um, you know, but it's um, it's certainly a seven out of ten. It's it's worth checking out. It's it's just in that era where everyone's hairs. If you there's a picture of them, is it? Yeah, sorry. If we look at the picture of them there, you know the hairs getting bigger. It's it's that thing where everyone's getting more glammed up. Everyone's getting excessive, and the bubble's gonna burst. And on this tour, they go on the Monster the Rock tour in the US, um, with Van Halen, Dokken, and but um, sometimes the ticket sales aren't as good. as as they should be, and I think that was a, a warning of what was to come. I think audiences were getting fatigued with the MTV thing, but bands would survive on big record sales till about 1991. So what happens next is they do the Crazy World album, and that probably wouldn't have done as well as it did if it wasn't for the track Wind of Change, basically the Cold War, because they have the Wind of Change track on the Crazy World album, and it does great business. It's double platinum in America and sells better than Savage Amusement. I've never got into the album. There's a track called Don't Believe I Really Like. I do like, I've come to like Wind of Change and the Semi and Angel, another ballad. Um, but it's just never, I bought it when it came out, it just never, um, it never grabbed me and I've tried getting into it. It's kind of a six out of 10 for me, but it's not an album I have. Then after that, things, they, they navigate the 90s badly like a lot of bands. A lot of the classic bands of the 70s, 80s had really struggled in the 90s and often lost members. Um, Francis Buchholz would leave. And Herman Rarebell would leave later. They would do the Face the Heat album, Pure Instinct and Eye to Eye. I don't own any of those albums. I've heard them all. Uh, the Face the Heat album is worth checking out for free tracks um, for me. 
there's Unholy Alliance and No Pain No Gain which are really good and then there's a track called that opens the album called Alien Nation that's one of the heaviest and most powerful songs they ever did um, when the album starts you're like oh this is going to be great but nothing matches that but it's a great track um, massive um, so it gets to the end of the, the 90s and there's a big gap of five years I mean this period they do an orchestral album an acoustic album uh, and they um, you know they're getting big in territories in South America and they've been big in the eastern bloc countries when the walls come down so the Scorpions are truly a global act like um, Uriah Heep um, you know that they, they broke into the eastern bloc but the Scorpions I think are one of the globally biggest acts in, in the genre of rock and metal um, then in 2004 they make a really strong comeback record called Unbreakable that has all the elements of the classic Scorpion sound uh, I remember getting a copy of this on my mate and thinking this is really good um, uh, it, you know it's not um, classic classic but it's a good record there's not a bad track on it um, uh, and there's some really really great tracks like Borderline, Blood Too Hot uh, there's a lovely ballad called Maybe I Maybe You which is piano led um, uh, can you feel it this time you know uh, through my eyes I'm just looking at the titles here there's 13 tracks on it so it's quite long uh, production's good it's contemporary but it's got that scorpion's edge but I've um, uh, I've always you know thought that's good it's, it's just a solid 7 out of 10 then they did this album Humanity Hour 1 and people seem to slag this um, but I think it's really good uh, I think the problem is is that they kind of had this stupid concept with it which it's not really a concept for that one they brought in outside writers James Michael and Desmond Child but it's got quite a lot of lower tunings on it um, uh, some of the guitars it's pretty heavy um, but I think the writing there's some really strong songs like Hour One Game of Life We Were Born to Fly My Favourite um, Three Two One uh, The Cross I really like that one the title track on the end um, there's some good ballad work on it. Um, at the time, I was kind of like, oh, it's, it's amazing, it's 8, 9 out of 10. I'd probably give it a 7 now. Um, I'd say I prefer it to Unbreakable, but Unbreakable's maybe more consistent. Then they did Sting in the Tail, again, keeping the comeback going. Uh, a lot of the mags raved about this as a return to form. For me, I prefer the other two albums. I think it's a solid 6 out of 10. The mastering's ridiculous on this album, so loud. But they brought in Mike Michael Nord Anderson and Martin Hansen as co writers and producers, and have worked with them since. Um, there's some cool tracks on it. Uh, in actual fact, the ballads, there's four ballads on this, and they're, they're my favourite tracks on The Good Die Young, Lorelei, Sly, and The Best Is Yet to Come. Uh, that was the first dance at my wedding. Um, uh, so. It's um you know I could see why people if they're coming back to the Scorpions would really like that I wouldn't say don't not get it um it's worth having, uh, and then recently in twenty fifteen, after saying that was the final album and they weren't gonna it was gonna be the final tour they've been on an endless tour and they did this, uh, Return to Forever, lovely packaging I think I paid eight quid for this there's a, there's a great picture of them in there James Cotax no longer with them but, I think that just captures the spirit of the band so well. Um, they're just having a great time, they're still looking cool and they're ready to rock and they're, they're just, they're amazing, amazing institution. Um, this has actually got 12 tracks and 4 bonus tracks, some of these were reworked tracks from old sessions. Um, uh, I would say this album, you know, none of the tracks are bad, uh, We Built This House kind of stands out, that was the single, that was a track called The Scratch, I'm not into that, but um, you know, the, the songwriting's good, the playing's good, Klaus sounds good. Matthias, you know, they're all really good. Um, uh, so again, it's kind of 6 out of 10. It's, it's worth having. You can get a deluxe edition, tour edition of this. Um, so I think at the moment they're still touring. Mickey D's on drums. And I think they're probably playing another album. Klaus is 72 this year. Rudy's 72. I think Matthias is 64. They're amazing. The Scorpions. So uh, check them out.